Welcome to Spaceverse, your portal to cosmic adventures. At the very center of our Milky Way galaxy lies a monster, a supermassive black hole called Sagittarius A. But here's the twist, it's flickering. That's right, this cosmic giant, which we usually think of as dark and mysterious, is pulsing with bursts of light, almost like a candle flickering in the void of space. It's a sight we never expected to see so clearly, and we have the James Webb Space Telescope to thank for that. Over the past few years, it's been capturing some truly mind-blowing data, and just recently astronomer Yusef Sade and his team published their findings that are shaking up what we thought we knew about black holes. From subtle twinkles to sudden flares, Sagittarius A is putting on a light show, and we're finally getting front row seats. Now, just to clear things up, we're not actually seeing light from the black hole itself. Black holes are famous for being so dense that not even light can escape them. But what we are seeing is light from the chaos happening around it, the accretion disk. Imagine a swirling, glowing whirlpool of gas and dust spiraling into oblivion. That's the accretion disk, and it's heating up as it spins faster and faster, glowing brightly enough for JWST to catch it. And by studying that glow, we can learn what's really going on in that wild, energetic zone around black holes. Is our galaxy's black hole growing calmly, steadily? Or is it more of a chaotic eater, gobbling up matter in bursts, causing the light to flicker and pulse? That flickering is exactly what JWST has spotted coming from Sagittarius A, our supermassive black hole. So in this video, we're diving into this exciting new study by Yusef Zadi and collaborators. First, we'll break down how this glowing light around black holes is even created. Then, we'll look at what JWST actually saw. And finally, we'll explore what all this means for how the black hole at the center of the Milky Way is growing, and why it might be a lot more dramatic than we thought. Alright, let's jump in and talk about how the light around black holes is actually created, because even though black holes themselves don't emit any light, the space around them? It's some of the brightest in the entire universe. There are all kinds of ways light can be produced in that chaotic environment, but let's start with the main player. The accretion disk. That's a swirling ring of gas, mostly hydrogen, that's being pulled in by the black hole's insane gravity. As this gas whips around at breakneck speeds, the particles start rubbing against each other, creating intense friction. And with friction comes heat. Now, when things get hot enough, they start to glow, that's called thermal emission. It's the same reason red hot metal glows, or why stars shine. And the hotter the material, the more energetic the light it gives off. Since black holes are extreme environments, the light we get is super high energy, often in the form of X-rays, which have really short wavelengths. In fact, most of the time, we spot black holes not by seeing the black hole itself, but by detecting this X-ray light using special telescopes. Whether it's smaller, stellar mass black holes in our own galaxy, or the gargantuan supermassive ones in distant galaxies, that glow is a giveaway that they're feeding and growing. And here's where it gets even cooler. All that X-ray radiation doesn't just disappear. It slams into the gas and dust around the black hole, and that interaction can trigger other types of light. For example, an X-ray hitting a hydrogen atom might make it glow in a very specific color of visible light, something we can actually detect with our eyes and instruments like the James Webb Space Telescope. When we collect that light and break it down by wavelength, basically measuring how much light we're getting at each color, we often see a big, clear peak. That's a telltale sign that there's a black hole nearby, actively growing and feeding. Now, sometimes the intense X-ray light from the accretion disk doesn't come straight to us. Instead, it hits the surrounding dust, which forms a thick, donut-shaped ring called a torus. This dust is made up of larger, heavier molecules that can block high-energy radiation like X-rays. But here's the cool part. Instead of just absorbing the X-rays and doing nothing, the dust actually re-emits that energy, but in the form of infrared light, which we can detect using infrared telescopes, like the James Webb Space Telescope. Then there's another fascinating process called synchrotron radiation. This happens when fast-moving electrons, those tiny negatively charged particles orbiting atoms, get caught up in magnetic fields. When these electrons are accelerated in a direction that's perpendicular to the way they're moving, they start emitting light. 
Around a black hole, gravity is constantly pulling everything inward, so electrons end up spiraling and accelerating in just the right way to create this kind of glow. Synchrotron radiation is incredibly versatile. It can give off light across a huge range of energies, from powerful X-rays all the way down to low energy infrared. And this is just one of many ways we can get light from the wild environment near a black hole. Each process leaves a unique signature, a specific distribution of light across different wavelengths, like a cosmic fingerprint that tells us what's going on around that mysterious object. All of these different ways light is produced near a black hole, thermal emission, synchrotron radiation, dust re-radiation, they all combine to create a full light signature or energy distribution that we can observe with our telescopes. It's like trying to figure out the ingredients of a cake just by tasting it. We look at the overall light and work backwards to identify which processes are at play. But here's the tricky part. The light coming from around a black hole isn't nice and steady. The accretion disk is a chaotic mess with clumps of material and constant collisions. That turbulence means the brightness can change over time, it flickers and flares depending on what's happening in that moment. And on top of that, our telescopes don't see the full picture all at once. Each one is tuned to specific types of light. For example, the James Webb Space Telescope is optimized for infrared, so we're not seeing the high-energy X-rays or the entire light spectrum, just a slice of it. So when JWST observes a black hole, what we're mostly picking up is the infrared light coming from synchrotron radiation which are those spiraling electrons in magnetic fields and any glow re-emitted by the surrounding dusty torus. And that leads us to what JWST has spotted around Sagittarius A, the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way. In this latest study, Yusef Zadi and his team used JWST to observe Sagittarius A at two specific infrared wavelengths, one at 2.1 micrometers and the other at 4.8 micrometers. These precise observations are helping us better understand what's happening in that mysterious, flickering core of our galaxy. Now let's be real, observing the center of the galaxy is no walk in the park. For starters, it's absolutely packed with stars, and on top of that, there's a thick blanket of cosmic dust. So when you point a telescope like JWST toward that region, you're bombarded with all sorts of light you're not interested in. To actually study Sagittarius A, astronomers first had to block out all the bright starlight and then carefully subtract the background glow from the dust. Only after all that can you isolate the faint, flickering light coming from the accretion disk around the black hole, which by the way is tiny on the sky, even with a powerful telescope. NASA shared a beautiful animation in their press release to visualize this, but let's take a look at what the raw data actually looks like from the research paper. Here's the breakdown. The data was collected on several separate days across 2023 and 2024. That's why you see those dashed vertical lines. They mark the gaps in time between the different observations. So don't read the graph like it's a continuous timeline. It's more like snapshots from different days. You'll see two main data sets plotted. The blue points represent shorter wavelength infrared light, higher energy, and the red points represent longer wavelength infrared light, lower energy. Those extra black and gray points? They're reference stars from elsewhere in the image. Their brightness stays steady, which is crucial, it shows the variation we're seeing isn't from the telescope or the environment, but from Sagittarius A itself. That's what makes these flickers so exciting. This kind of analysis is super important because it shows that the flickering we see isn't just noise or some glitch in the data, it's not a processing error or something affecting the whole image. The nearby stars in the frame stay consistent, so any changes in brightness we do see are real, they're coming from the actual material swirling around Sagittarius A. And what's clear from the data is that the black hole's accretion disk is constantly changing in brightness. You got this low-level flickering happening all the time like a steady pulse, but then suddenly, bam, you get these big, bright flare-ups that spike above the background variation. But it's not just about how bright the light gets. There are other really interesting clues in the data that tell us more about what's going on. One of them is timing. Is there a delay between when the two types of infrared light arrive? Well, there is. When the team compared the peaks of the light curves at 2.1 micrometers and 4.8 micrometers, they noticed that the higher energy light always arrived first, followed by the lower energy light, sometimes up to 40 seconds later. 
That kind of delay tells us about the physical processes happening in the disk, like how the energy is cooling down and spreading out over time. Another key thing they looked at is called the spectral energy index. Think of it like the slope of a hill. It tells you how quickly the brightness ramps up as you move through different wavelengths of light. The steeper that rise, the more energy is being packed into the higher energy wavelengths. It helps scientists understand the mechanics of how that light is being produced and how intense the conditions are near the black hole. By looking at how steep the light curve rises or falls between wavelengths, scientists can actually learn a lot about what's producing the light in the first place. In this case, most of the light is coming from synchrotron emission, basically, electrons zipping through strong magnetic fields. The steepness of the light curve can reveal things like how dense those electrons are, how fast they're moving, and how powerful the magnetic fields are that they're spiraling through. Now since JWST only observed two infrared wavelengths here, 2.1 and 4.8 microns, we don't get the full energy spectrum. But even just comparing these two points, we can still tell a lot. For example, which wavelength is brighter? How much brighter? That difference gives you a snapshot of how sharp or shallow the energy distribution is. Yusef Zadi and the team did exactly this. They calculated how steep the energy slope was across all their observations by comparing the brightness at the two wavelengths. And here's what they found. During the constant, low-level flickering, the slope was steep, meaning there was a bigger gap between the two wavelengths. But during the bigger flares, that difference was smaller, so the slope was more gradual. So putting it all together, this gives us clues about how our galaxy's supermassive black hole is feeding and evolving. What causes the steady flickers? What triggers those sudden, bright flares? And how do those timing delays and spectral changes help explain what's physically going on in that extreme environment? That's what we'll explore next. All right, let's break down those two different types of flickering we saw, because according to Yusef Zadi and the team, they're likely caused by two completely different processes. First, the more subtle, low-level flickering is probably just random turbulence in the accretion disk. Think of it like little hot spots popping up in the swirling material, some parts getting denser and hotter for a short time, glowing a bit brighter, and then fading back into the mix. Since hotter regions give off higher energy light, this explains why you see more of the shorter wavelength light, like at 2.1 microns compared to the longer one, which is 4.8 microns, which gives you that steeper spectral slope. Now the big spikes, the dramatic flares, are thought to come from something more intense. Magnetic reconnection. That's when magnetic field lines around the black hole suddenly snap and relink, launching particles outward and releasing a burst of energy across a wide range of wavelengths. That would explain why the difference in brightness between 2.1 and 4.8 microns is smaller during these flares. The energy is spread more evenly, so the slope is flatter. It's actually pretty similar to what happens on the surface of our sun. You've got small-scale jitters all the time, but now and then, boom, a solar flare erupts from magnetic chaos. Now, let's move on to that other key observation. The time delay between the two wavelengths of light. What could that be telling us? That time delay between the two types of light seems to tie back to the magnetic field again. It's worth pointing out that we already know Sagittarius A has a strong and well-structured magnetic field, thanks in part to observations from the Event Horizon Telescope. Now, while we don't completely understand the full picture yet, the best theory from Yusef Sadi and the team is this. During one of those flares, the particles emitting the light start to lose energy because of the magnetic field. And interestingly, the higher energy light, like the 2.1 micron wavelength, loses energy faster than the lower energy light. That could explain why we see the shorter wavelength light show up first. But like any good scientific result, this raises even more questions. For instance, are we really seeing all the tiny variations? Some of them could be getting lost in the background noise. And what about those flares? Do they repeat in a pattern? Or are they just random bursts? To get clear answers, longer observations are needed. That's why Yusef Zadi and the team have already requested to use JWST again, this time hoping to observe Sagittarius A continuously for a full 24 hours. That should help cut through the noise and maybe even reveal whether our black hole has a rhythm to its growth, 
or if it's all just cosmic chaos. And that's a wrap on today's dive into Sagittarius A and its mysterious flickers. Thanks for exploring the cosmos with us here at Spaceverse. If you enjoyed this cosmic journey, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for more out-of-this-world discoveries. Until next time, keep looking up!